You're listening to Hear Arizona. Addressing issues, empowering our community. This episode of The Education Cliff is in part supported by Intel, innovating and investing in Arizona communities since 1979, and a supporter of Here Arizona Education podcast series, telling stories that change lives and strengthen communities. Resource info can be found at hearearizona.org. Ever since he was a kid, Chad always wanted to be a teacher. Growing up, I, I always looked up to my teachers and, you know, for advice or for anything. And, and so I remember getting into college and be like, man, well, what do I want to do? And just remembering all my teachers and be like, man, that's, that's something that I want to do. I want to be able to help kids. I want to show them, show them things in life that, you know, maybe, maybe they wouldn't generally see. He took a less than traditional route to getting his teacher education, starting out at Chandler Gilbert Community College. Did my two years there to get my associates, and then they have an NAU campus on Chandler Gilbert site. And so, you know, I, I, I went there for the two years, um, uh, had a great time. That's, that's actually where I met my wife. And so, um, you know, it was awesome. After graduating, he started teaching in the East Valley. I was teaching 7th and 8th grade math, which is something that, you know, like math was one of the only things that I was, all, like, always good at. And so, um, you know, first year, I, <laughs> you know, very, very nervous, super scared to have 30 kids in my classroom and, you know, and just be like, hey. He loved his job. Like most people who were willing to teach, the rewards outweighed the challenges. That is, until they didn't. After five years of being at the junior high, I was starting to get worn out, and the major thing was uh, was money. I, I was picking up as much as I could. Uh, I did what's called a six-fit schedule, so I lost my, I had my prep taken away, and I picked up an extra class to make more money. I was also the head wrestling coach at the junior high, and so in those five years, I was just I was getting worn down. I was like, man, I'm, I feel like I'm doing a whole lot for not very much compensation. So he left for better opportunities elsewhere. His friend got him a job at a local investment firm. Chad asked that we not use his last name, since his wife still teaches in the same district. His story is not unique. Lots of teachers here Arizona spoke with said they contemplated leaving the profession, or they know teachers who found happiness and better pay working as bartenders, real estate agents, or literally anything else. This presents a huge problem in Arizona. According to the Arizona Teacher Retention Project, 42% of teachers hired in 2013 left the profession within three years. The five most commonly cited reasons, salary, class sizes, workloads, benefits, and a perceived lack of respect from students, administrators, and parents. In Here Arizona's previous episode, we discussed several factors that have contributed to Arizona's consistently poor rankings on education. Recruiting teachers is challenging, especially teachers that are representative of the students they serve. It's also expensive to train and educate teachers. But all of those problems can be traced back to the state's teacher retention issues. Not a year went by that I taught in the classroom for 15 years that there was at least 10 to 12 new teachers on my campus. That's Marisol Garcia, a teacher and vice president of the Arizona Education Association. For particularly underserved communities where the school is the most stable part of the community, when you have teachers that are coming and leaving every year and not being that stabilitating force, I, as a student, I knew, oh, you know, Mrs. Greedo was always going to be there and I could come back to her as a fifth grader, as a sixth grader, as a high school student. I could come show her I graduated from high school and college. When you start to fracture that one debilitating first person, it really does impact the health of the school. And so the, um, the, the retention is why we have such need for such high recruitment. On this episode, we'll look at each of the factors affecting teacher retention and some of the proposed community-based solutions. I 
I remember my dad telling me, it was like, when I told him that I was going to be a teacher, he was like, you know, you're not going to make any money. And I was like, yeah, I know, but like, it's more about helping kids. It's obvious that teachers don't make a lot of money. Here in Arizona, the average salary for teachers is about $50,000. That can be much higher or lower depending on a number of factors like education level, school district, and years of experience. What's nearly universal among teachers, though, is debt. The average student debt load is about $37,000, according to the advocacy group Education Next. For a teacher with a graduate degree, which is often a requirement, that number goes up to about $48,000. The average monthly payment on that debt hovers around $400. When we were actually making our payments and everything, and, and the month to month, it was, you know, it was scary. I, I remember when we first bought our, we got our first house, and it was like, okay, here's our house payment. Here's our uh, student loans. Here's our like credit cards or whatever other random stuff that we had. And there, there was sometimes it was like we were sitting there at the end of the month and we're like, okay, we got we got 300 bucks to last us two weeks. You know, it, it was tough. And this was before they had children. And then obviously when my son came along, it was like, oh man, like we have we have even less to spread around, you know. And so it it, it was tough trying to figure out student loans and everything right out of college and and into the teaching profession. For a lot of teachers, it makes more sense to find a higher paying job outside of education, at least until their loans are paid off. In our last episode, we met future teacher Christopher Cuellar, currently earning his post-baccalaureate teacher certification from Scottsdale Community College. Because I still have mountains of student debt for my bachelor up at NAU. About $50,000 total, he said. As he works to become an educator, he's glad he's not adding too much money to that balance. The community colleges themselves can't address teacher pay problems, but they can certify teachers a lot more cost-effectively than a four-year university. If the issue is you shouldn't have to go into debt to become a teacher, then community colleges help to solve that problem by providing cost-effective programming to, you know, through various pathways to become teacher certified. That's Dr. Jennifer Gresco, the faculty chair for teacher prep programs at Rio Salado College. A student enrolled in one of these programs pays $85 per credit hour, about $5,000 to complete the entire program. That's one semester at a state university. Like, I really had no idea that I would be able to even afford the program, but fortunately they had the scholarship money to be able to allow that for me. The money comes with a catch, but most people say it's worth it. One of the deals about signing on with the scholarship is that you have to teach in Arizona for at least a year. And uh, I plan on being here for a bit. With his wife, Megan, in a post-baccalaureate nursing program at Paradise Valley Community College, Chris says they plan to be here for a while anyway. Arizona has made an effort to make paying for a teaching degree a little easier. State Representative Michelle Udall, a Mesa Republican and high school math teacher, explains. A few years back, uh, we created a teacher's academy here in the state, and that has been very successful. We were one of eight states in the country that actually saw an increase in students in teacher prep programs. Um, so we are moving in the right direction in far, as far as getting more uh, students into the teacher prep programs uh, in a pretty big way, especially compared to the rest of the program. The Arizona Teachers Academy isn't a place, it's more of a trust fund. It pays for future teachers' education. So if you're in the teacher prep program, you can get your, usually it's your junior and senior year paid for, and then you make a commitment to teach in the state for that many years afterwards. Um, and so it's been vast, it's been amazingly successful. Teachers leaving the profession complained about benefits, too. Chad's son has diabetes, and when Chad was on his school district's insurance plan, they could barely afford his son's medication. 
I mean, like his doctor visits, his insulin, his syringes, like everything that we need for the type one, it was outrageous. The, the expenses and, and the, the insurance in both school districts was not the best. Um, you know, we were, we were spending money like crazy. And so um, just on insurance and then on top of that, having to pay for all the prescriptions. He figured there was no reason to keep working at a job that didn't allow him to adequately provide for his growing family. That's what that's what really kind of drove me to be like, you know, there's got to be something else out there that I can get better insurance and I can uh, make a little bit more money and help uh, better provide for my family. On his old insurance plan, a vial of insulin cost about $30. At his new job... When I went to pick up the insulin on the new insurance... Billy was like, you have a zero dollar copay. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I almost like broke down because I was just like so happy that our life is changing so much for the better just because I switched jobs. The second most common complaint among teachers leaving the profession was class size. According to the U.S. Department of Education, class sizes across all grade levels in Arizona were well above the national average. Poor teacher retention makes this problem even worse. Marisol Garcia has firsthand experience with what happens to class sizes when teachers quit in the middle of the year. So my second year teaching, we lost a science teacher in the middle of the school year near the end. Um, it was just too much for him and he left. And so what that meant is the entire seventh grade team had to teach a section of science. I know nothing about science. Um, and I have seventh graders, which, you know, I normally teach eighth grade and sixth grade, but seventh grade is a whole different level. Um, and it was science fair time. So I'll just put that into context. Additionally, during my prep hour, which is the hour where I meet with my colleagues to plan, um, I was asked by my administration to cover an eighth grade ELA class because they too had lost a teacher. Even when I was doing my sixth fifth schedule, um, you know, taking on that extra class, I, I had class sizes, you know, just under 40. Like most of the class sizes were like 36, sometimes 38. You know, I, I had extremely large class sizes. And so that was always super tough, especially when it came to like grading a math test. It was like going through a, uh, like 100, 180 to 215 tests. Without a planning period during the day, he had to do all his planning and grading at home. Not anymore with his new investment job. I just get to play with my son. I get to have fun with my son until he goes to bed. Instead of just like sitting there and just being like, hang on, bud, hang on, hang on, I need to do this. Like, it's, it's a lot less stress and it's a lot, a lot less out of work time. Class sizes have also played a role in discussions on teacher safety amid the pandemic. State Senator Leela Alston, a former teacher and Democrat who represents portions of East Phoenix and South Scottsdale, explains. So how on earth do you achieve a social distancing when you've got classrooms so overcrowded? Even if you have more space, where are you going to get the teachers to man those spaces? You know, how do you manage 30 first or second graders in one classroom? I, I was always a high school teacher, so I didn't have those little ones to try to, to keep safe and now socially distance with masks on. I, I imagine that that is an absolutely major endeavor. The classroom management at all just makes my head spin to even think about it. Laura Elizondo handles human resources for the Avondale Elementary School District. In her experience, teachers who leave over class size say they feel a lack of support, since other teachers are also spread thin with large classes of their own. Sometimes it's just the loneliness factor of I'm one teacher with 30, 25, 30 students or so, whatever the class size is, and I don't have lateral support or, you know, colleague support, whatever. And so the loneliness of that really turns people away. Because when you become a teacher, it's not just teaching the students that are in front of you. It's you, you embark in this taking on the whole community, right? Regardless of class size, teachers are expected to handle more than just their students. There are parents and community members to support too. You're taking their parents and their grandmas and their guardians and 
separate parents, two different households, you know, all of those pieces that you need a strong support in the school to help you get through those humps, to help you know how to talk not only to children, but also to adults um, to help you navigate the workload, the data collection, the all of those pieces. So if they're doing it by themselves, then it's really difficult to manage by themselves. In Avondale, though, teacher retention is relatively good, higher than the state average and on par with the national average. Elizondo says a common salary system that rewards teachers based on their individual performance actually causes more problems since it forces teachers to compete instead of collaborate. Do we as a district have programs embedded within the districts or compensations embedded that disrupt that collaboration? That if I do better than you, I get more than you, so why am I going to help you instead of me doing better than you? You know, those traditionally embedded um, compensation structures that are not helpful to the collaboration so that everybody moves forward together at the same time. In Chad's experience, collaboration wasn't a problem. He said he actually had a supportive administration and colleagues. We had like we had our little math hallway and so all of us math teachers, we were all super close. So I still talk to a lot of them now, even though I'm not teaching, but uh, still just catch up with them and everything. Administration was awesome. Um, they, you know, uh, especially being a first year teacher, they were, they were very hands on, uh, came in your classroom quite often. And, um, you know, just to not as like a like, oh, I need to check on what you're doing. Just as like a way of just being like, hey, like you're doing a great job and they're, they're very supportive. Another common refrain among teachers leaving the profession is the Kafka-esque bureaucracy of the education system. Standardized tests, state-level standards, federal regulations. Arizona Education Association President Joe Thomas says that's a lot for some people to handle. We have limited the amount of creativity that uh, educators, in particular classroom teachers, feel like they can bring into the classroom because they've got to hit all the, the standards. And it's not always easy to find something that is relevant, that connects with your students, that you can spend additional time on to bring into your classroom. Marisol Garcia says the numbers game and standardized testing can be demoralizing for a lot of educators. Many of them feel frustrated. Many of them do not feel comfortable in the, in the classes that they are in. They don't have the supports. And so a lot of them drop out. Or secondarily, a lot of them um, just get barely get through. Um, and then take a test. Once again, the state looks at that test measure and says we are that these students are failing instead of we as a system are failing these students. Arizona can't fix its teacher recruitment, diversity, and debt problems until it corrects its retention problem. One of the perks of non-traditional and alternative certification programs, like those offered by the community colleges, is that statistically, these teachers last longer in classrooms. I think actually in many cases, they last longer. Um, the reason being, well, some of them came to it later in life and have decided, yeah, this is what I wanna do. They have a little bit more experience under their belt and they're a little more self-aware, shall we say. Udall herself is a graduate of one of these programs and works alongside other educators who are part of Teach for America, another program that offers qualified people alternative certification. However, I think, for example, Teach for America, they have such a big cohort and those cohort members stick together and they support each other and it's, it becomes kind of like a family. And so I know in our own school, uh, we have a couple TFA teachers and I know they still get together with their cohort regularly, even though they're teaching in various places throughout the Valley. When districts aren't able to provide support and mentorship, programs like Teach for America can. And so I think that makes a difference, that, that extra support and kind of family to go back to when you have problems or questions. Um, and, and I think that's kind of the kind of things we need to be building is those mentorships, those support systems for new teachers. Joe Thomas agrees somewhat. He worries these programs don't adequately prepare people for how hard it is to actually lead a classroom. You, you want to have uh, people believing and feeling that they can move into education as a second career, regardless of what first career they come out of. And we, we see people do that all the time. 
Um, they thought it was going to be an easy job, maybe with summers off. Uh, they're some of the best people to talk to about the challenges and the difficulty facing educators because they will tell you uh, as loudly as anybody, uh, this is the most challenging job I've ever had, it's, and yet it is the most rewarding job I've ever had. Teaching was rewarding for teachers like Chad. Many need a break, and many do come back after a few years. I asked Chad, Are you leaving your options open to go back, or are you pretty much done with teaching and happy where you're at? <laughs> um, that's a tough question. I, I'm... I still do. I still do wrestling. I still coach wrestling, and so I think I think that kind of helps my internal wanting to help kids. Um, I think that helps like alleviate that part of of me that's like I need to be there to help somebody. I guess I I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I haven't really thought about that. But until Arizona can successfully retain the teachers it invests in training and hiring, it can't even begin to tackle the other problems. In our next episode, finding qualified applicants for the state's hundreds of open positions vacated by teachers that the state can't retain. You just listened to an entire podcast episode on the state of education in Arizona. So obviously this episode means something to you. To learn more about the issues in Arizona's education system and the organizations we profiled, visit our website, hearearizona.org. That's H-E-A-R, Arizona. Tell all your friends to check us out too. They can search for Hear Arizona on their favorite podcast listening app, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, NPR One, Spotify, and since we're all about empowering our community, we want you to be part of the conversation. Follow Here Arizona on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. This podcast series is made possible by a grant from the F Squared Family Foundation and support from Intel and Rio Salado College. Here Arizona is a production of the Division of Public Service at Rio Salado College, which includes Sun Sounds of Arizona, Spot 127, KBOC, and KJZZ. This episode was produced, written, directed, and hosted by Scott Bork. Linda Pastore is our executive producer. Thanks for listening. Hi, this is Scott Bork from Here Arizona Podcasts. Since you're still listening, you're obviously a fan of ours. We want to hear more from you. Visit hearearizona.org and take our listener survey. That's H E A R Arizona.org. Thanks for listening.